just to maybe sort of see and get you to tell, give us a bit more detail on the on the things you were you were doing. So I think we'll start with John and, and Wolves. I believe you've you've got a video to show us, John. Yeah, um, I, I might just sort of talk through it first, uh, Steve, because um, I think that might might make might a little make more sense. Um, like like I said, really going back to that that you know self sustainability um, in terms of our overriding thing that we try and do in the academy, um, and then the independent decision maker as the as the sort of second thing really in terms of you know almost what we what we're trying to to, to develop each individual to, to actually do. We looked at okay, what are five areas that we know we can actually uh, commit to, and we know that um, the boys will be able to do, you know, at home with their families, and or they'll be able to, to sort of do at home independently. Um, and considerations really for, for things that we, we had to really think about was um, what the boys actually have access to. And uh, so again, we're, we're we're going into this lockdown assuming that everybody's got a football, for example, um, or we're going into this lockdown assuming that everybody's got strong internet connection for for Zoom calls and. And meetings and, and stuff like that as part of our, our discussions and, and actually that isn't the case um, because of where, where we are really in Wolverhampton we have boys coming in from, from lots of different backgrounds so we really had to consider um, like I said a few weeks in um, immediately it wasn't at the beginning because I think that was one of the mistakes that we actually made moving it like I said moving away from actually having a player-centered approach rather than just trying to do something blanket to us going through the process a little bit and thinking well, hang on a minute um, we maybe need to take a step back and, and, and actually think about um, each each individual um, in terms of what they actually have access to um, and what they're at, what they how much they actually want to do um, to, to to sort of motivate themselves to, to get onto it. Um, again, going back to that independent decision maker, one of the one of the, the sort of things that we always look for is is how many players are intrinsically motivated to actually uh, want to try and get better and themselves rather than someone actually having to, to drive and push them. That's not to say that the boys that we have to maybe drive and push aren't going to be successful in the game, um, because there's not really any evidence on that as such. Um, however, we try to, to develop them to, to, to be intrinsically motivated to, to actually want to get better and want to improve. Um, and the five areas really we looked at, like I said before, uh, number one was well-being um, and, and social, um, because that's, that's at the forefront of it, because ultimately, Everything that they know, everything that they do um, is completely out the window. So no school, no friends um, and very, very limited um, outdoor sort of activity. Um, so we split it, split it down to, to a further four then. So what could we do with them um, sort of technically uh, and tactically? So technically um, for the younger players, we are uh, fortunate to, to work with um, my personal football coach at Souls, um, Souls platform and website. Um, where there's technical sort of skills um, and tricks and moves and stuff like that for the boys to, to actually practice um, on there that sort of aligns itself to our technical program. Um, so again, they're not sort of practicing something that we don't normally do um, when, we're in, when we're in club. Um, through that, they're able to, to sort of upload videos onto that website or upload it, um, they will sort of, sort of send it through, through WhatsApp, uh, their parents' WhatsApp to, to the coaches um, to sort of review and provide feedback. Um, tactically, um, looking at utilising our performance performance analyst team, uh, analysis team, um, with sort of setting tasks for for, for the groups and, and for individuals. Um, you know, again, how much they, they really want to sort of expose them to um, the fitness, and, and obviously linking back into the well-being side of it. So, you know, utilising Strava, utilising our strength and conditioning coaches um, to, to set programs. Uh, for the group and then sort of conditioned programs for for the individuals based on their needs and and, um, and obviously what they have access to uh, coach development as uh, some of the guys have obviously spoke about already because um, that's important so part of the reflecting um, also um, bringing in guest speakers utilizing speakers that we actually have internal as well and um, because again we've got quite a lot of experience uh, coaches uh, at Wolves um, that could, sort of sh could have shared their experiences uh, with the staff. So we've been pleased to, to sort of go through that that process. And then the fifth one, obviously, is, is, is education. Uh, I wouldn't say it's number five in terms of order, um, but it's number five, obviously, in terms of um, my, my list of things that we've, we've, uh, we've actually promoted and, and sort of encouraged, um, really, with the boys throughout this period. Um, I think the other thing to, to sort of consolidate it and wrap it up together was we... Um, designed a homework pack for, for the boys where they were able to sort of log and track what they were actually doing. Some stuff that we were setting and an additional activity that they've actually done. 
um, or anything really that they're sort of learning and experiencing as they're going throughout this, this, this experience of, of lockdown. Um, I do have a video um, that I'm going to share now and just play for everybody to, to see. And then I like waiting for them to make the room, but the passage of time a bit too heavy. I was just staying on the defenders. Ew, what did you do to get like so good at your jubilee? For me, a, a big thing is is doing uh, is doing extras after training. this time now where we're all not doing anything everyone's inside it's the right time to work on yourself um, and make yourself bigger make yourself stronger ready for when you come back So, so hopefully, um, hopefully that that video um, brings to life um, a little bit of, of of what I was just sort of explaining and um, going throughout the process, and and I think it sort of goes about saying how excellent I think the response of the staff um, and and of the players and of the parents has actually been throughout the period um, to try and keep the engagement levels, you know, to to, to where they've actually been. Um, like I said, for throughout the the whole of the lockdown. Uh, thanks. Yeah, John. I think uh, what the video really shows is the different spaces that all the all the players were were working within. Um, so I think that is a, a quite an interesting aspect of that. Um, I don't know if I can turn that on to, to Ben in terms of the things that you did with the players. I don't know if you could very briefly one or two things, but things that were specifically right. Let's have a look at the environment our players are operating in, and let's kind of work to that. Yeah, again, it's hugely individual. Um, so two examples that I'll draw on. Um, the first one is uh, the uh, some of the professional players have been doing their formal coaching qualifications within the academy this season. Um, so the PFA have been running a B licence qualification, which some of the uh, under-23s and some of the first-team senior players have been completing 
one of the things we've tried to be clear on is that the guys that are going through the qualification invest some time working with the younger players in the academy to a kind of generate and develop those relationships but also be ensure that their coaching experiences are genuine that they're reflective of the environment so our under 16s coach again has developed a really strong relationship with one of those players who's invested a significant amount of time coming out coaching with the boys and spending time doing one-to-ones uh, so as a consequence uh, they've done quite a few uh, Zoom calls with the under-16s and he's tried to utilise them in a collection of ways. Uh, the guy is a, a centre-half uh, who's had quite a, um, a significant number of experiences on loan. Um, so he's used those experiences with the defenders uh, about the things that he's learned from playing in Germany, from playing on league from uh, a plan under some significant managers that are uh, you know, at the top end of the game. Uh, and to use that to try and support the players' development. Um, but also, quite cleverly, obviously, the 16's decision about scholarships were made uh, for some just before Christmas. Um, and he's also used that, uh, that player who was released from his contract, who went into a college programme at 16, 17, 18, before being re-signed and then spending a significant amount of time in, on loan situations to try and support those specific 16's who've been released um, to A, be motivated, but I'll start to understand some of the possible things that they can be considering in their pathway moving forward. So that's the first example, quite specific to that group. Uh, the second one has been uh, our head of player development, our under-18s coach, uh, who've done a lot of work on leadership, um, particularly with three of the players that are in our under-18s group. Uh, so it's been a significant amount, amount of time, sorry, in a relatively small group, generating conversation, talking about what leadership might be, how it can be individual to them, and then trying to use the, the sort of formal programme that the players have been engaged with to enable those players to take stronger elements of leadership roles in driving some of that programme forward and taking responsibility for the way that that looks. So I think the, 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 the key point is that it's hugely individual. I think it's difficult to be, able to, to, to be able to arbitrarily say everybody should be doing this, particularly when as a club we've said that individual is important. And it's also important to then understand well, what does individual look like for this age group and for that age group, for that player within the age group, and then try and ensure that we can respond as best as possible to their needs. All right, thanks for that, Ben. And so we'll try and deep, dig a little bit deeper in terms of what, though, what the challenges that would provide if you're looking to be very specific in providing a, a sort of a programme that's still maintained, looking at the individual rather than sort of doing a, a group in this sort of situation with the remote, remote sessions. Um, Keith, I'll sort of turn it back to you. I think uh, you sort of briefly mentioned one or two of the things that you're doing. I don't know if we could uh, um, specifically focus on um, the sessions you, you had when you've brought people in from the outside. I sort of noticed in John's video that they were using first team players and sort of former academy players, but I think you sort of mentioned with Stuart Pierce, you brought in and sort of what, what that sort of added, what sort of dynamic that added, bringing someone in with that experience in, into your group. Yeah, it, it was it was amazing really to see we, we did it as we, we sort of aimed for one guest speaker a week, if not two, um, to sort of uh, go alongside the one session a week we were offering to the players, whether it be, you know, a Zoom session on the grass or something physical. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, we, we started off with, with a couple of first team players, but obviously, like I said, the dynamics is slightly different in terms of furlough. So once that happened... Um, we couldn't go into that but there was a very you know we had people on so for last week for example we called the Premier League week where we had Tom Heaton and um, Callum Wilson of Bournemouth Robbie Savage who obviously has played Premier League uh, Ricky Lambert as well um, so we've had a consistent trend of either players or or people like Darren Harris who was in the in the blind blind England team uh, given his sort of experiences and what we found was uh, Eric Steele, obviously, who's working with David uh, Dekea um, at Man U, his experience working with Ferguson, Chris Kirkland uh, delved into sort of his career in mental health. So we've also had Troy Townsend on in terms of racism and kick it out campaign, that sort of stuff. So we found that what we did, for example, was we'd open it up. Um, you know, the Q&A would go, would go fine. You know, we'd bounce off with questions with the kids. But it was really, really, uh, there was a real common trend in terms of the kids' questions, in terms of what they were always asking the players or the people that, uh, like someone like Gary Banford is in the Special Forces, or who was for 20-odd years. Um, and it was always around, like, how you deal with setbacks, you know, um, you know how, how do you deal with 
uh, you know, coping with the crowd, how do you deal with injury, that sort of stuff. So that was number one common trend. Tom Heaton used a great phrase like he, he, he learned with, with his psychologist was exposure equals composure. You know, the more you're exposed to these sort of these elements and um, the more you're going to get composed in these situations. So, and what I must say about the speakers, they related everything to the kids in terms of under eights to under 18s to staff members. I remember Stuart Pierce was talking, he said that um, he was probably in that 1% bracket that he did everything possible to play a good game or have a good career, or have a good week in terms of not even answering his phone, his phone on a Friday before game day. So he said that no one would ever have that up on him. So he'd never come away from a game on a Saturday, for example, then, and, and he, hasn't, he hasn't prepared um, you know, in the best possible way. So I think that the trend from the kids was, was very much about, and, and also they asked an awful lot of questions around your routine during lockdown. So they asked about the questions to Tom Heaton and, and Callum Wilson, what's your routine, what's your routine? And it was funny, you can see it here on the chats when they come up and the questions, these kids kept asking and repeating and repeating as if to say, ask this question, we need to know this question, we need to have a parallel with these players, we need to, and, it, and we ended up asking the question around lockdown diet because it came from about 20, 30 players. Um, and I think they almost want the reassurance of what they're doing is correct, you know, and, and they're actually, you know, they're normal, aren't they? They're normal. And I think Gary Banford from the special boat services who, who served in Iraq, Afghanistan, he, he has such a, tra a, a he, he switched it. He works now in terms of positive mindsets and companies and he, he's been doing that for two years. But, but what he really sort of got across to the kids is that what is normal? you know, what is normal? You've been in this environment for, for nine weeks. This is the new normal, you know? So, you know, what is so bad? What is so good? How do you adapt? Or human beings, we should all be able to adapt. That sort of concept. And he, he related experiences he had on tour, obviously, where he'd be 14 weeks in isolation, sorry, 14 days in isolation with water and, you know, very, very limited resources, but he was happy. They knew what they were doing. They had a plan. And he was sort of relating that to the kids. And I think once they heard all this sort of relevance to real life um, and relevance to their domain that these people were working in, um, yeah, it was very, very interesting. And I think the kids, you know, we, we had a great response from it. And I think the messages seem to be very clear and simple from, from ex-pros or, or, or ex-military was that, you know, always do your best, always, you know, work hard, et cetera, et cetera. And, and Robbie Savage was very, very unique because that message came through a lot from our six, seven, eight speakers, whoever we had on. Um, but the one thing we took from him and the kids took from him was like, you know, believe in yourself, which we know, um, and, you know, setbacks, et cetera, et cetera. How do you deal with them? People have different techniques and, and, and so on. But, the one thing was really unique with him. He was on about people, you know, um, sort of not believing him, you know, telling him he wasn't good enough, that sort of stuff. But he sort of flipped it and says there was plenty of people out there who believed in him, you know. So for all those who didn't believe in him, um, say when Alex Ferguson signed him but then released him, say with that class in 92, um, you know, he had managers like Mark Hughes, Steve Bruce, who believed in him. You know, he had, he had a career of people believing in him as well as these setbacks. And I think the kids and the, and the staff and the parents, um, however way they looked at it, they would, have took, they would have taken different messages from these particular speakers, you know. Yeah, some, uh, some great messages coming there from the speakers. I think it's yeah, very interesting just to hear the, the questions that the, the young players were, were posing as well, so seeing where their, their mindsets were. Um, to move move to Jan and um, yeah, sort of uh, sort of reveal one or two of the things you've been doing at, at Utrecht. Yeah, well, um, I'm going to try to share the screen and do it by a few uh, sh uh, videos and and pictures. Um, let's see how that uh, works.
Nou Kjeld, challenge uh, geaccepteerd. Ik ben hier bij de KVB. Ik heb een mooie muur, een goede bal, dus ik uh, ga het proberen. So this is, uh, this is our club captain. He is challenged by one of our under 17s. Uh, the under 17 player won the challenge of his team and uh, 16s, uh, 19s. And then he was, uh, he could ask uh, for a shirt of uh, the yeah. club captain in this situation. And he challenged him and this challenge went into the academy. Now you see another 13 player on the left side. He's trying to do it at home. You see a little bit different technique, uh, like uh, the club captain. Uh, maybe also a little bit different environment. And uh, he has to do everything on his own. There's nobody there to, to help him. So uh, the under 13 player stops the video, uh, sends it through to his uh, teammates and, and um, um, coach. You see the first team player is a little bit ahead of him. 130. And now he, he starts a little bit funny. So this, this is one of the examples that, the, um, so it started with the CEO, uh, the technical director, the head coach, our academy manager. They all made sure that everybody was aligned. And I must say the first team players, they were great. All the challenges uh, that they got, they, yeah, they worked on really well. This is another one. So on uh, uh, above, you see all the, uh, uh, the challenges and on the left side you see all the levels so when the level goes up it gets more difficult and as soon as you were able to uh, yeah to, to to finish it you would go on to another one uh, there was only one problem that because of the homeschooling uh, the kids like this more than the than the school so uh, the parents asked us to uh, to be careful with the amount of time that they put into this kind of challenges um, a week after this challenge, we set no challenge at all. And we asked the players, okay, can you make this um, schedule uh, better? So uh, some of them uh, created levels uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, and others, they created challenges uh, uh, more. So like different sports, uh, different techniques, different ideas, um, everybody from their own uh, perspective. Um, uh, all this stuff was also shared with, um, with all the, the, the clubs we worked together with, so that 19 affiliated grassroots clubs. Um, all our coaches are also club coach, so that means that they have one, two or three of those affiliated clubs. Um, and it was all shared on, um, um, what is it, social uh, media. This is uh, as something we do a lot in the Netherlands. Um, we play this kind of games, but now this time there were all challenges. So two, three or four players could, could play this game. And then every time when uh, you hit uh, one of the boxes, uh, there is a challenge. So one of the challenges could be uh, get a fork as quick as possible. And they were all on Zoom. And uh, yeah, the one who was downstairs, that was easy. The one who was upstairs, was more difficult, but maybe that they had another uh, chance. So that was more ownership with the players. And yeah, it, there were a few very crazy challenges coming in. Um, this is something with the staff. We wanted to stay aligned with, with all the staff members, not only the coaches and the assistant coaches and the, and the, uh, the performance staff. Uh, but also everybody who was uh, uh, yeah, supporting the academy. And this is one example of a quiz we did. Um, you know, the club um, uh, anniversary is 50 years. So all the questions were about uh, what happened in those 50 years. So also for people who didn't know the club that well, um, they could uh, learn a lot about it. Um,
Hoor, ik ben Donneve van FU Utrecht onder 9. Bedankt Feyenoord voor deze WC World Challenge. Wij gaan deze uitdaging graag uit. Maar het hoeft nog niet meteen, we kunnen nog wel even wachten. We gaan er met z'n allen voor de bundelende krachten. So yeah, a few a few things. This is the picture of the stadium, and behind it, our uh, 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 pitches, uh, training pitches, and academy uh, pitches. So that video was about Feyenoord under nine challenging FC Utrecht under nine, and FC Utrecht under nine challenging later Sparta Rotterdam under nine. Um, and uh, you also heard, of course, a club song of all, all the fans. So I just wanted to give you um, a certain update of all kind of different um, challenging situations that were created by coaches, players, uh, first team staff, first team players, and they were all aligned. This is just a little bit because if you give a little bit space to those people, um, yeah, that's amazing. That almost explodes. Um, I'll try and tie two or three questions all together. There's like a lot of questions around this idea of putting on individual sessions versus group sessions. Um, and I guess we'll start with Ben, because this seems to be something that you, was, you were very conscious of doing. Um, sort of first, yeah, what were the challenges of doing that? And, and what, was, what was the balance? Were you still looking predominantly at doing keeping things individual or was it kind of a, still a 50-50 group and individual sessions that you were putting on? Yeah, I, I don't know that I've put necessarily statistics against it, but there will always be group-based stuff by virtue of the fact that I guess football is a team sport um, but as much as possible, thinking about how those tasks respond to the individual nature of that group and then the individual nature of the players there. And probably the biggest learning some of the greatest awareness that's come is in this time you really start to recognize the coaches that have got a deep understanding of the players and their families because the consequence of that depth of knowledge and understanding that probably informs the decisions that you make about how much information you might provide the type of information that you might uh, provide and how frequently you might interact with those parents and those players and, and the nature of that interaction some of our coaches that had a deep understanding of um, some of those players' home life were really thoughtful about the frequency of communication, about the time at which they would communicate where maybe they could take some of the pressure away from parents and ensure that the boys have got, have got you know, in some cases, a friendly male voice that they can connect with on a daily or a weekly basis, which are probably really important skills. Um, I think as much as possible then, the coaches taking responsibility for designing what the work looks like uh, and as much as possible that being responsive to the perceived needs of the individual. So we've seen uh, some of our older age group doing individual analysis sessions, um, some of our coaches setting tasks for players that are physical and technically individual. Uh, but I guess probably as alluded to before, and I think one of the questions that's in the chain, being deeply minded that most of this stuff is genuinely just about engagement and demonstrating care. Because I don't necessarily know that we might we might improve some game knowledge in terms of the stuff that people can repeat and tell us, but I don't think we're going to generate any game understanding by virtue of the fact that we're not playing football. And I guess if we want to affect learning, we probably need to be playing football to be able to affect learning. So I think in most cases we've tried to be clear that this is really about developing a deeper understanding of each of those individual players, what we perceive their needs to be, and if we can strengthen that relationship, then upon return to the training ground, I hope that'll only support us accelerating the players' learning.
Steve, sorry, you're on mute. Oops, sorry, <laughs> sort of unmute the wrong person. Yeah, sorry, thanks a lot for that, Ben. Um, we'll sort of move that on to, to, uh, to Keith. Um, it's given you an opportunity to look at the players in their own living environments. Um, is this something that you may try and incorporate as you move forward, or is this just a real one-off for this, for this particular moment in time? Um, I think it's difficult to answer in terms of we don't know how you know we are going to get back to what you call normal. Um, I think I'd echo what Ben has said. I think further now, I think uh, I think limited tactical game understanding is probably at bottom of the chain. I think it's all around you know social well-being. You know we've been very conscious of around you know we you know understanding families we we understand that but you know these families might be going through redundancies or what we we don't know we don't know what what is happening um so we've been obviously putting on these sessions and evolving it every every week um, and we've we've had a good response from it i think going forward we probably don't know um what we have found sort of on the fourth fifth week of doing it is that players have been emailing in as in, can you, you know, design a specific session for me, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's, there's something, there definitely is something to be said that instead of setting the kids' challenges, which we did at the start, um, there was something definitely unique around them feeling that structure, but they have still designed the sessions, for example, but feeling that structure and being, and being watched and, be, and being sort of encouraged to, to improve. Um, there was uh, the feedback from the parents is that they've loved that seeing each other on the screen again, seeing all the players against each other, evolving into breakout rooms where there might be skill challenges. And, and what we've seen is a, a definite improvement in those technical aspects, particularly with the younger ages when you're talking about under eights all the way through to maybe 12s, um, where then you might maybe talk about tactical understanding. But yeah, it could it could be Steve, but I think it's just very very hard to say, isn't it? I think that there might be something in it around you know players who, for example, if you sign a player who can only get in twice a week, what are you doing for him on that third day? Are you giving him something extra in terms of a one on one session online, which we've done and has worked really well? Um, I think there's probably something in that definitely, but I suppose till we get back to whatever we call normal uh, when we do get back, I suppose then we can only we can only maybe take it from there. Thank you, Keith. Um, with John, um, I don't know if we can sort of move it on in terms of what we're thinking about as what this new normal will be when we return to the pitch. And again, sort of maybe going back right to the start, if you return to grasp, what would your approach be to that? Would it still be the same as you would, you would you sort of approach this challenge of being in lockdown or you kind of looking at it a different way based on things that you've learned in the last six weeks? I, I just think I just think really in the last six weeks the biggest thing um, that that we have maybe learned is is deeper reflection skills, deeper reflective skills, um, because I think everybody can say that they reflect really well um, when in the program, when sort of in action. But I'm not sure that that is actually the case. Um, I think people are really good at talking about it sort of afterwards. So what we what we what I'm getting at really is 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 actually deeper reflective skills. And being able to, to marry in action and then also uh, and also afterwards and that's probably the, the, the big thing um, that we're actually learning and maybe taking away from this period um, and I think bringing it back to what Ben um, and also what Keith was talking about and even Jan as well was, was talking around um, developing those deeper connections really with the individuals in the program um, because again we think we know the players, but I think we've learned a lot more about the players throughout this period than maybe we would have done if we were if we were actually in club. Um, and then that can also ramp up how we how we then in turn support them um, to to develop um, and support them to to obviously move forwards. Okay, yeah, thanks, John. Um, we we'll put Jan on the spot now. Um, we're sort of talking about we don't really know what the what the sort of future environment is going to look like, but sort of Jan, you've been back now at Utrecht for one week. Um, so I don't know if you could share with us some of those experiences you've had at Utrecht and what are the slow steps you're taking back from sort of moving out of lockdown into whatever this new new normal is going to be. Yeah. Well, one 
one thing is, uh, let's say, the most important, that you don't want um, anybody to get ill because of your enthusiasm. Um, so that is the starting point and uh, the end point and everything between it is also about that. So everything what, what you do when you go on the grass again, uh, you have to be so careful that you uh, take the right decisions and step by step by step, little small steps. Because the players, the coaches, even the parents, um, maybe even a few other people, they want to go back as quick as possible to um, the end of February in terms of uh, everything is normal again. So if we would talk about uh, training sessions, six training sessions, two hours, um, 20 uh, players in a gym with all an individual program and that kind of stuff. Now, uh, in the Netherlands, it's not happening. So what I want to share is a few, um, a few um, uh, pictures of... Um, uh, how we um, uh, how we managed to uh, to go back uh, to the pitch. Um, so one of the things I want to say is that this is advice for players. It's in Dutch, uh, and uh, at, on the right side, it's more the so we call it uh, Corona, um, uh, sort of um, 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 yeah things you have to. Uh, to do. And one of the things you see already is the, the one and a half meter or five, five foot uh, distance. And, um, but that means also that um, there can only be one player per car. There can only be six players on one pitch with one coach. And after the session, everybody goes home, inclusive the coach. Because uh, you have to uh, remember that when somebody gets ill, you have to track all the activities of everybody because otherwise you have to close down the whole academy, of course. Um, it can't be with public traffic. There is no public traffic and the, uh, the players who arrive at the pitch, um, they can't go in the, in the uh, dressing room. So they have to stay outside. So they have to be already in the kit when they arrive at the club. And after the training, they have to leave in the same kit directly after the training. So it means that if you look at uh, the training time, what we started with uh, 75 minutes, uh, that means that you need 15 minutes before to set everything up and 15 minutes after to yeah, to, to, uh, to break everything down, that the new group can come in on a clear uh, pitch. So all the balls have to be washed, all the bibs have to be away, new bibs, all the equipment have to be cleaned. Um, yeah, so, so it's uh, a total organization. Uh, and washing your hands is, yeah, uh, before and after and uh, any time that you can do that. Uh, no hands on the ball. Um, so that is that is uh, 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 that kind of stuff. So um, there are much much more uh, rules, um, but they will come back in in a few pictures. So this is one of the the guidelines how parents should drive and uh, drop off and pick up uh, the players. Uh, uh, let's say drop off before the training and pick up after training and that has to be all aligned C parents can't stay on the parking lot they can't go out of the car they have to stay in their own car because if the parents start to stand together and uh, yeah then you're responsible um, and you see how many pitches you need if you can only train with six players plus one coach on one pitch so um, and that every time in a time slot of 75 minutes on the pitch and then half an hour, 15 minutes before, 15 minutes after. So you almost need already a whole day of organizing step by step after each other. Um, then the distance between um, the coach and the players. Here you see uh, just a small example. This was one of the activities we did for... Um, one, one uh, of the uh, affiliated clubs. 
um, with our coaches uh, being on the pitch. And here you see also that um, the rule is that under 12 and younger, they can train together, they can play games. They're, for that age group, it's not um, a rule that you have to stay away uh, five foot uh, or one and a half meter from, from each other. But coaches have to. So coaches cannot stand together. They have to, uh, to, to have a distance. And uh, players and coaches can't go close to each other, even in that age group under 12 and younger. Um, so here you see some examples. Now, if you look right, then you see still the label on the bib. So if you see here, he has a blue and a green bib. That green and blue bib are new and they take that home. They wash it at home because it can't be uh, worn by anybody else. Um, then here you see that they can only already play. So you see two 1v1 situations on one pitch. It's a sort of a dribble game. Uh, it can score as a dribble. And then the others are starting directly again. So this age group can do that. Uh, this is uh, the older age group. So um, under 13 and above. Now, it's just, just one example. So you see, um, again, it's, it's a challenge, it's a game, like you saw in the examples before. Uh, one of the players before had to hit the target, the goal, and in the other situation, they had to play 1v1 and try to score by a dribble in one of the three goals on, on the other end. And this is, of course, not possible in this age group. So you have to find situations that they, they are challenged. And, at the same time, they have fun, but fun in a way that, yeah, you have to uh, do certain uh, activities, uh, quick movement, quick turning, uh, but related to the opponent who has the ball and you have to, uh, to protect your goal. Um, so here you see 4v4. But one team has a goalkeeper, the other team not. If you miss the goal, you have to catch the ball. So now it's four against three. And first a shot with the left and then a, a goal with the right. But you see again that in this situation where I spoke about earlier, that is, it are transitions, stress situations, um, and uh, feeling comfortable in uncomfortable situations because there are so many uh, challenges going on that they have to be aware of. Um, this was the last game and then there would be a final. Now, I think you know that a to play a final is, is everything uh, they want to go for. Um, washing the hands afterwards, you see the medical staff is away from the players. The players can stay closer to each other. Everybody washes their hands. Everybody keeps the bib, takes it home, washes it, and dry your hands. Um, this is, this is um, you can imagine FC Utrecht, professional club, everybody is watching that. If we make mistakes in that, everybody will, uh, will say, okay, you don't take your responsibility. Um, uh, stop training, first make sure that everything is all right. Well, till now, we did this for one week. So uh, what we try to do now is um, um, to go uh, to two training sessions with eight players on the pitch, uh, two staff members, and uh, make the training session a little bit longer, hopefully 90 minutes. And then it goes on and on. So then we try to go to three training sessions with 10 players, three members of staff, and go to a two-hour session. And then um, every time in, uh, more, more players, more staff on, on the pitch, step by step. But maybe that will take us eight weeks to go through those steps, or maybe, depending on the 
uh, experiences and yeah as long as uh, yeah everybody stays healthy then of course and everybody keeps the rules then we can go uh, forward on that um yeah so a few questions were also asked if if, if that's okay steve if that's okay if i go on well, I was gonna, I was gonna throw those questions over to the to the other guys because uh, yeah, I think there's one or two questions that have been specifically from an English perspective on on this. But um, yeah, I'll certainly leave it open for the guys more to ask you questions. I think I'm certainly sure that they've got questions themselves, having having seen that. So maybe start with with Ben on on this question we got from Andy Bevan, sort of the looking at it from the sort of situation in England. And um, potentially, how, what do you? How are you planning returning to to the pitch? Obviously, things are still up in the air. But I think from what Jan's saying, you know, clearly you can't just go straight back into normal sessions. This is going to be a, a gradual process. Yeah, I guess um, it's almost similar to what Keith said. It's almost impossible to say how we go back until we've kind of got some kind of timeline about when we're going back, and then what the guidelines and all the legislation will dictate that we can or can't do. Uh, first team are scheduled to go back towards the end of the month. Um, similar to a lot of the guidelines that Jan referenced, we've got eight of our under 23s that are um, uh, implied to go in and spend time in and around the first team training environment to support them with numbers, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And there's a, a fairly strict set of uh, conditions, similar to what Jan alluded to uh, going in training kit, coming home in training kit. Uh, if you're going on public transport, you wouldn't be one of the players that would be able to go. You need to be able to go in your own car, etc. 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 I guess our under 18 and under 23 season has been uh, cancelled. We're waiting to hear from the league about um, what the kind of decisions around that will be. There's been some suggestions that the 23 league may look a little bit different next season. And I guess once we get those kind of ideas about what the league will look like when we're returning and then what the guidelines that are informed how we return, we can probably start to look at some of the stuff that Jan's got in place there. I guess I'm kind of minded like the planning piece is really important, but then at the same time, we don't want to spend too much time planning for eventualities that don't play out because you invest a whole load of time and energy locking your thinking into a particular way of approaching stuff that gets drastically changed when some of the goalposts move. And I guess tentatively in England, we've still got so many steps towards just general integration of work and just general health that, Football probably just needs to, I don't know, personal view, football probably just needs to hold on to itself a little bit and just be careful. Uh, I think otherwise we're going to end up trying to run before we've even decided that we can walk. Yeah, I think uh, we'd all echo those 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 sentiments, Ben. Um, with John, um, you see we're sort of moving into the summer and this is traditionally the, the close season and normally you would just, right guys, go and have a holiday, enjoy yourself. But uh, I mean, what, what are your thoughts sort of moving into that, that, that period of time? Is it a case of, you know, you're going to have sort of greater contact with the players or, right, just go and have some downtime? I think it would be a bit of both, really. Um, in, terms of the, in terms of the senior age groups, um, they will actually have some, some downtime, uh, some opportunities where to, to literally not necessarily think about getting up and, and doing um, the Strava Challenge or, or sort of following a, a strict programme throughout the week. Um, they'll actually have time to, to to just down tools a little bit because, like Ben alluded to, um, I think it's it, it's it's absolutely crucial that we don't get ahead of ourselves in terms of trying to get them ready for something that we don't know is even coming um, at the moment in this country. Uh, for the, for the younger ones, it's a little bit different um, in the sense of we've kind of prided ourselves on on providing um, some some structure um, in their lives and providing some form of continuity really in terms of what we're asking them to do. Uh, them sort of completing the homework challenges as, as I went through uh, sort of earlier on in the in the webinar. Um, so what we're actually looking at doing uh, with the with the younger groups is, is having some downtime, but then also having some some structured activity. And so at the moment we're in discussion really of what that period will look like for, for example, for our nines to fourteens, um, in terms of maybe having three weeks off, two weeks, um, two weeks of some activity, of some engagement really from the staff. Um, another two weeks off, another week on, another week off, another week on, um, sort of approach really. So we continue to have the structure really in their life and have some form of constant, because I think that's important as well. 
um, rather than saying, okay, the staff need a break, so we're going to go away for, for five or six weeks now, and then we'll see you later on in July, because ultimately we don't feel that that will be useful for, for the boys and their well-being. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the approach, really, that we, we've taken. Um, like I said, we've, we've had a lot of structure. Um, we've, we've been consistent, really, with, with, um, with what we've, we've sort of provided and the engagement and the conversations. But, you know, equally, um, there needs to be some form of a break. Um, but we don't want it to be too long because that structure has been important for the boys. OK, thank you, Ben. Um, um, Keith, I don't see you partly answer one of these questions. Um, Sean Malcolm, um, are you obliged to follow government guidelines only? Or does or will the club create its own guidelines to safeguard the players? I mean, I presume there's already, you're already working towards that anyway. Yeah, we are. I think, I think we're very much, we're going to be governed by, I think, government guidelines, aren't we? I think, uh, first and foremost, it's going to be the health and safety of staff, players and everybody. Um, I think, uh, like Ben says, we do not know, you know, when we're going to be back. Um, so I think in, in, in our, in what works with us is that our academy manager, Dan, Dan Robinson, has been very vocal on the now and the future. Now, the now we can sort of, you know, we can affect it at the minute in, in terms of a week to week basis. The future, I think we probably have two to four maybe contingency plans depending on what happens. Um, but I think first and foremost, what I, I definitely believe will be governed by the, the government guidelines first and foremost and probably take it from there. I think, for example, our 18s, we, we don't know what that program will look like next year in terms of the uh, managing up to first team you know a lot of them might be involved we, we don't know we, do, we just do not know at the minute so that's one one scenario that could play out that we're trying to time them to come back in and, and be a bit more involved in, in that training uh, regime uh, like we said we don't have a reserve team but yeah I just think that we've got a couple of options don't we um, and I think in our heads we all probably have the ideal that we just go back to normal um, you know but but we we might not, and that might take like Jan has done in, in, in Holland to, you know, stage it. Um, I suppose we just don't know. But I think as a club, we, we would probably definitely be following the government guidelines in terms of what we do um, and, and then take it from there. Okay, yeah, that's a yeah, sensible approach, I think, there, Keith. Um, sort of getting a, a bit, sort of conscious of time, so we'll make this the last question, guys. Um, it's the first question that came in, so I'm not sure if Laurie McGinley is still with us, but um, as coaches, um, what have you learned in this lockdown in terms of your own CPD? Um, we'll start that, I guess we'll go to the top and start with Jan. Um, now, first of all, uh, uh, stay, um, don't dive in directly, just first get a good um, sight of the situation, um, get all the opportunities and uh, make choices uh, together that, that uh, people also can support and, and understand. Um, what I learned, how important it is that from top to bottom, everybody is aligned and that everybody get the right information. So that meant that the CEO uh, was um, approachable and also the technical director and uh, the, the academy manager um, and um, well me myself I did uh, a few courses I took time to, uh, to read some books there's so much available at the moment um, uh, in webinars and, 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 and real good uh, um, um, uh, messages uh, coming out from every level um, even I followed a few of players themselves who started web, web webinars to talk about uh, playing and uh, young young players um, what you can't rule is what players do outside of the club of course um, you can say that it's not allowed but you have a lot of uh, individual coaches who uh, make a living of uh, this time uh, uh, period because they can play, they can train one-on-one -on -one situations. Um, and put a lot of um, energy in things that you normally um, can't do. 
So I had a full list of uh, points that, that we as an academy uh, focused on to make sure that um, the message of the CEO, so make sure you come out better than you went into the, the lockdown, um, that we focused on and we were also able to share that with other uh, departments so we could, they did the same, so we could also learn from them. So to be honest, uh, of course, um, yeah, you don't wish for it, absolutely not. But sometimes to get this kind of situations to, uh, to, 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 yeah, to focus that, um, yeah, that insight is uh, good that why wait for this kind of things? Maybe you have to do it more often to, to uh, create stillness and, and, and stops. That's a good point, Jan. I think we're always talking about sort of creating challenges for our players, for ourselves. And, and yeah, here was, here was one ready made to sort of almighty challenge. Um, when it's come along, John, you've been sort of going through this process now for six, seven weeks. I mean, what are, what have been the big things that you've learned during this period? Um, is, is that a question on, on a personal one? So what, what have I, what have I learned or is it more? On Absolutely. This is uh, yeah, all about you, this one, John. <laughs> Um, I, I think I've learned a few things really in the sense of um, that in terms of working independently a little bit more um, because my personality um, trait really is quite inclusive uh, so it's it's a lot more to, to include and to talk um, to, to people and I think that's happened naturally anyway through Zoom and through Teams and stuff like that um, but then ultimately there's also been quite a lot of time where you do have to sort of sit and reflect and, and get on with things you know individually um, I'm actually doing a, um, I'm sort of right at the end pretty much now or near enough. I can see, I can see the, uh, the light at the end of the tunnel on a, uh, on a master's course, uh, doing a master's in sport and directorship. So, um, there's that big dissertation sort of ahead. So it's early, early stages really of, um, of that, um, and linking that to, you know, to, to coach development. Um, and then also like Ben, um, and, and Keith as well, part of the, um, EHOP program, the Elite Heads of Coaching program. So there's been quite a lot of stuff around, um, quite a lot of sessions being put on. Um, that's you know to designed to to help and, and develop people that are on the course. So it's been quite a lot of CPD uh, for myself in that sense. And then really the final thing is is actually, and I, I said it earlier on, is is actually utilizing the people that you actually have in the building. Because uh, I think sometimes as, as coaches, um, we're, we're always searching for sometimes new information or searching for, for something to maybe consolidate your bit of learning or something that you actually know. But actually, if you look at what you have in the building, there's a lot of knowledge, there's a lot of depth. And ben, ben made, um, ben made a, a, a point about that in terms of the 16s culture, I think it was. Um, he's got a wealth of experience, you know, similar, similar to, to, to myself in terms of looking at what we actually have in the building and, and actually who can help educate myself and, and some of the other people too. Okay, thanks, John. Um... As you've just name checked, uh, Ben, I think we'll sort of move on to Ben and yeah, what have been the big learnings for you in this period? Um, I guess I've tried to, the sort of large group teams, uh, Zoom meeting conversation probably aren't personal favourites. I prefer kind of similar to what John was saying, I think I kind of prefer the, the personal conversations as much as possible, just trying to pick up the phone or organise individual one-to-ones with as many of the staff as possible, not specifically to talk about their action plan or anything that they're working at, but just to pick up the phone and find out how they're getting on um and just i guess to check that not necessarily that they need me to check up on them but just to check they're doing okay and then as much as possible from the nature of those conversations connect people that perhaps aren't already hugely connected to share work and or share some stuff with them that might provoke their thinking uh, i know i'd initially said i wasn't going to share my screen but um I think one of the things I've spent a lot of time doing is going back over the work that a lot of our staff have done over the course of this season. Uh, and then we've recently just had, which finishes tomorrow, a two week holiday in inverted commas of all of the, for all of the staff. Um, so ahead of that time, this is something that I put together, which has just really been a reflection of a lot of work that the staff, myself and many other staff have done over the course of the season. So you can see our five kind of moments of the game at the top, controlling possession on the left across to restarts on the right. And there's just some examples of some of the varying teams, 
individuals, systems, approaches, you know, pick your language, however you choose that we've looked at, and then under, underneath each of those uh, um, uh, titles, so where Werder Bremen with the three box three, you click onto that, there's some clips of where Werder Bremen playing in a three box three, so just giving the staff some resources that we've shared at varying points with different individuals at, during the course of the season or during the lockdown period for people to reflect on. And then at the bottom, you've just got some of our staff uh, who at varying points have been filmed or with animated sessions that they've delivered at varying points during the course of the season. And just to recognise, I think like John was saying, about the skill already being in the building, that yes, we would like to engage and we do engage with people external, but I think often the more that you can enrich your own environment with the people that are already in it and recognise the skill that they've got, A, you probably increase motivation and B, as a consequence, you probably increase the value that people place both intrinsically and towards the other people that are in their environment. Uh, so... That's just that piece. And then through the middle, you know, I think Jan alluded to the kind of amount of podcasts and webinar, webinars, sorry, that are out there. I think as much as possible, just trying to zero people in on stuff that perhaps have been themes in the conversations that I've been having. So that was a nice example of a podcast of a guy that's achieved and committed to a whole load of kind of tough, extreme endurance things, but he's been using it as a means of trying to raise the, particularly around men's mental health, but just the conversation around men's mental health which has probably underpinned a lot of the conversations that I've certainly been having in sort of recent weeks. So um, I guess that's kind of the, uh, the intention behind some of that stuff and hopefully where it sits. I'll stop my share now, hopefully. Okay, thanks Ben. I knew if I uh, kept you here long enough, we'd get you to share your screen eventually. Um, just see if I can uh, complete the, the quartet then, Keith. Uh, well, you've got anything to share with us on your screen, but at least, um, yeah, share, share what your, your learnings have been over the past sort of six to eight weeks. Yeah, I think um, we've all hit that pause button, haven't we? Um, I think and you, you can definitely reflect and I think all your staff can reflect as well. Because um, I think what we do is we get so immersed in the day-to-day -day stuff that we do miss people in the building. Um, and that's, that's no fault, really. It's just a case of we're all getting on with our own, our own stuff. I think what well, this period, a couple of things, really. I think that um, what I've noticed with Zoom, and although it's not a favourite for everyone, I, I do think that there is a chance of more productivity um, in terms of, like, we always seem to have people in the building who are just so dedicated to what to do maybe more pro productivity in, in like what jo John and Ben were saying is in utilising staff, um, you know, in the best times and best place possible. And I think that's taught me that. I think that, you know, sometimes we don't need to be in at 9 a.m. If people need to be in at 12 but stay quite late days, we can still catch them on a Zoom meeting if it's, if it's, if it's needed, for example. Um, and, and having a bit more structure around that. Um, something Ben said there as well, what I've noticed is that, um, and these webinars and podcasts you listen to, and, and maybe it's something I've missed, and I don't know what the other guys think on this, is that I've always felt people aren't very, uh, I don't know, want to share their experiences or their work, and you know, it's all quite private in their clubs. And I think what I've noticed from this in terms of guest speakers we've had on, for example, just general life experience or club experiences, but particularly colleagues like what we've got on tonight, is that people are really, really willing to share what they do how we can help each other, that sort of stuff. Almost Ben, when we were on our AYA or your A license, that sort of stuff. And I think that this period is, has taught me that it has been open and it, it, it is very positive, but even more so people are, are very much willing to, you just want to engage with people talking about football and you can pick their brains on people and you can bring stuff back to your thinking, your line of staff, whatever it may be. And I think the last thing, um, what, what it's sort of just in terms of what we've been doing individually with the sessions is, um, particularly in the younger ages, we've got a great FP program in terms of the ball mastery, uh, carousels, all, all, all the stuff everyone probably does. It's just how much we really value it, you know, how much we, what I've noticed with the sessions we've done, particularly with the 8s to the 12s and, and, and the progression you've seen in four or five weeks when they've got a, when they've got four cones or four shoes that they're dribbling towards or because they don't have cones or whatever it might be, is how much we value that. Are we doing the 20-minute ball mastery into, you know, more small group work? How much is that aligned? Because I think that when you look at over a nine-year journey from, say, nines to 18s, if you want, is that it's just really triggered me thinking to think, well, actually, let's just slow down here. Let's get really the fundamentals really correct at those ages, um, which we all know and we all want to do. but 
it just triggered our thinking to go, well, let's really align it. Let's really structure it in a six week, 12 week program, having it fun, energetic, that sort of stuff. But really what are the outcomes of the players at the end of those sort of periods of time, you know? So yeah, that yeah, has been definitely two or three things that, that will trigger my thinking for the future. Fantastic, Keith. I think that's a, a great point to, to wrap things up on this evening. Um, I'd like to give a, a big thank you to, to, to the four guys for joining us today and sort of sharing their experiences and knowledge and, and thoughts on how we're possibly going to move forward through, through the lockdown into the post-lockdown and whatever the, the new reality will be for, for football. So, uh, Jan van Loon, uh, a, a great big thank you to you. Jonathan hunter thanks for joining me, man. Keith Gilroy, it's been a pleasure having you here. And, and, and Ben Bartlett, thanks for, for sharing your, your experiences. Um, also, uh, yeah, to thank everyone else out there for joining us and been some great questions and uh, a lot of good good feedback. Um, just leads me to say that I'll be back here again next week. Um, I think the plan will be next week we'll be with four academy sports scientists, although there is a chance that we'll have a German first team coach who's obviously there back to playing football this weekend. So see how yeah see who's available but yeah it'd like to be one or other of those two will be the session next week and hopefully uh with keith sort of talking about this sort of willingness to share that yeah we'll get keith ben john and jan back sometime in the near future when when all four of you are back on the grass coaching and, and seeing what that environment's like so uh yeah just leaves me to say thank you to all of you once again and uh, yeah thank you to everyone out there for joining us Thanks, Dave. Thanks, James. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, guys. Great Thank meeting. you, guys.